I'm going to start. Maybe I'll sit here. You can sit over there. Um, have uh, you start by each introducing yourselves for a couple of minutes. So maybe you can start. Sure. Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm the CEO of Pasture Map, and we build tech for building healthy grasslands. So we work with cattle ranchers, cowboys, and cowgirls um, to help them make more money and get productive by doing that optimization that we talk about by implementing more regenerative grazing practices rather than extractive ones, which is a win-win-win. Because if you grow more grass, you can stock more cattle per acre. You can use your land more efficiently, which makes the ranchers more money. Um, at the same time, you're building a lot of healthy soil that sucks down uh, a lot of carbon um, into the grasslands, which is a virtuous cycle that makes them more productive. So we are a tech platform that helps them do that. Thank you. Ugwe. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Ugwe Maneo, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Solstice Energy Solutions. And so for millions of people around the world who struggle to manage with backup power supply because of unreliable grids, Solstice is developing the shift, which is a hybrid smart meter and transfer switch that we feel is enabling the next generation of distributed energy management in emerging markets. Our initial target market is actually uh, my home country of Nigeria where over 60 million people depend on diesel generators and spend over $10 billion annually just to power them. We want to help them use energy more efficiently with our integrated hardware and software platform and help them find cleaner, more reliable alternatives like solar and storage. Thank you. Hedy. My name is Hedy Roglavi. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kiwi. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, incidentally, I actually met uh, my co-panelists uh, at the same event last year, so it's, it's good to uh, come a full circle. Uh, so at Kiwi, we are focused on uh, looking at energy consumption and uh, reduction of energy waste through um, electronic devices that are plugged into the wall outlets. Uh, most people are surprised to know that uh, for a given uh, commercial building especially, uh, the devices that we all plug into the wall outlets consume somewhere between 40 to 60 percent uh, of the electricity that that building needs. Um, and there, uh, the Department of Energy actually um, uh, projects that that consumption is going to increase by about 150 percent in the next 10 years. Uh, so it's a big problem without a solution. Uh, you can imagine that we all now have and use a lot more electronic devices than we used to 10 years ago. And uh, it's, it's continuing to waste electricity and waste resources. So uh, we are an energy optimization software company. We allow for the tools that commercial building uh, managers, as well as the occupants themselves, can use to bring uh, new techniques and uh, technologies for reducing that consumption and uh, turning essentially turning things off when they're not uh, being used or needed. So we have worked with uh, institutions like the San Francisco Airport, a couple of different entities at Stanford, uh, the University of California at Davis, and uh, one of our newest uh, additions to the list is the Levi Stadium down in Santa Clara. So uh, that's what we do. Great, thank you. You all have very powerful visions, and you've already had successes and, and uh, made great strides in where you're going, but I'm sure you face challenges. So what I'd like to hear about and maybe share with um, the people here is what's, what are some of the major challenges that you've faced? I'll start since okay. this is a women's panel, right? So the, the first question whether people are explicit with it or not is like, how did this get into cattle ranching? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, um, at best it's a bemused curiosity even though, so I, I try to get out ahead of it by saying, hey, I have a land use and agriculture degree from Stanford. I've worked on farms in four continents. At this point, I've personally interviewed 1,500 farmers and ranchers in the process of building pasture map, and like I started as a dairy farmhand. So those are some things that I just I like to throw out to get ahead of it because there's not there's not a good way to get past people's preconceptions of you other than just that I found other than just to name it. Um, I don't think I've come up with a good proxy for how to do that in, uh, in front of investors in the venture world. And I often t so I was on a panel for minority female ag tech entrepreneurs in, 
in Salinas last month. And what was shocking to me was, and every one of the other four entrepreneurs on that panel was like, we'd been working in the space for, I've been working in it for four or five years now, and other people up to 10, none of us ever knew anybody else who was a minority female ag tech entrepreneur. Um, so I think visibility is super important. Like showing up is super important um, to change people's perceptions of what uh, an agriculture tech, a sustainability entrepreneur should look like. Um, I also think the venture community needs to do a lot of work on its own uh, to recognize what the, but for, as far as what I can do to surmount that challenge is just to keep showing up. And um, there's, there is a lot of privilege that comes with saying I have three Stanford degrees and I present as an Asian female. There are other parts of me that are outsider status that are not as visible, but um, so I'm under no illusion that there, if I were a darker skinned brown person of color who was an entrepreneur in rural America going to Nebraska and Idaho, um, if I were a black woman, a black man, um, the challenges I would face would be even, it would be vastly different, right? So I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to just show up as we are to be visible and walk through the doors that we have um, open to us because of the different measures of privilege we have and then turn around and kick them down for other people. That's my, my rant. <laughs> okay. Well, how about you? Thank you for lofting that over to me. Um, <laughs> I, I will piggyback off of uh, some of the challenges Christina's laid out with being a woman in entrepreneurship and um, especially being a woman of color, an African American woman. I think you mentioned earlier that about 10% of startups are, that are venture backed um, have women on their starting team. Uh, there's only about 11 African American females who've ever raised VC funding over a million dollars, and one of them in like the past several years just happened. So um, visibility is important, and having uh, communities like this is extremely valuable. And that's been one of the challenges I face. But also um, doing business in Nigeria, uh, where the startup ecosystem isn't as developed, has been pretty challenging, especially being a woman and being young. Uh, that's been probably the key challenge. I have a co-founder that is a white male. And I think that's been extremely valuable for me because we've had this great relationship uh, where he really understands some of the challenges and can kind of come in and play a valuable role while we're trying to navigate a very young ecosystem abroad. So I'm fortunate in that way. Thank you. Hedy, do you have anything? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off of what was mm -hmm. already said to some extent. Um, you know, my, my co-founder, Jennifer, uh, we, so we have a team of female co-founders, also young. So we also mm -hmm. face the same uh, skepticism when we are dealing with customers, investors, whatever uh, you may think. Um, but to, to the point of my co-panelists, uh, the more you show up and the, uh, the more prepared you are, the, the, the less likely it is that that is going to continue to be a problem. Um, more on the personal front for me, uh, I come from a different background. Uh, I, I did my PhD here at Stanford in bioengineering, looking at computational modeling of blood flow. and. Um, you may think there's probably no direct link between that and energy efficiency, but I promise you there is. Um, I got to live in Germany uh, on a two and a half year long uh, expat assignment, and when I, as soon as I got there, I realized that uh, energy efficiency and energy is used is looked at very differently um, in the rest of the world in the U.S. And so that's where my interest in, in um, energy and sustainability came from. Uh, so starting Kiwi and uh, working on, on this problem has been uh, a, a great challenge in that I am continuously learning, uh, have had to uh, get exposed to a whole new field that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but that's what makes entrepreneurship great um, because I think even if I were part of the same, um, if I had the same background, uh, you go through building a company knowing that you don't know everything and uh, you have to just continue, continue to learn uh, even you know, more than a year and a half into it. Uh, I'm still learning, uh, maybe not on the specifics of sustainability anymore, hopefully I've graduated a little bit from that, uh, but whether it's uh, you know, enterprise sales to uh, fundraising to anything else, there's always new things that come up and so it's been great uh, facing that challenge. 
So you already have um, acquired a lot of wisdom, the three of you, from the experiences that you've had. But I think people would be very interested in knowing if you have advice for anybody who is thinking of starting uh, a company. So maybe we'll start with you, Hetty. Sure. Uh, my advice would be do it. Um, it's, it's rewarding and it's amazing. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, I remember when I was thinking about this, and I've always had an interest in, in entrepreneurship, uh, there was this sort of, uh, you know, a little voice in the back of my mind that always thought, okay, it's got to be looking for the perfect project, the perfect idea, the per perfect solution, the perfect time. And that perfect is, is not going to be there. It never happens. So if you're thinking about it, just uh, go ahead and jump off the cliff and you'll figure it out along the way. Uh, that is, I think, uh, the, the biggest learning that I had and the biggest inspiration that I had when I first uh, started working on this, that it's okay to not have figured everything out along the way. You, um, you do it as you go. So that would be my advice. Don't, don't, be, don't be concerned, just do it. Um, I got started on this path taking CEE 246, Entrepreneurship and Civil Engineering. And one of our advisors had told me, if you're going to take this into the real world, I hope you're really ready to deal with rejection frequently and not buy into this glamorous, you know, entrepreneurship, CEO lifestyle. And that was clearly, which is not um, at all, that was clearly the best advice that I got hands down because um, while you might be really passionate about your idea and think that everyone should buy into it, um, you have to be aware that it's a long road and you face rejection a lot. And you have to just be ready to pick yourself up and keep going um, and have a great support system around you. And I think had I not been told that, it might have been more of a painful journey than it needed to be. I would echo you already have what it takes just by being in this room. You're at Stanford. Don't doubt that you have what it takes. That's not the issue. Um, it was really helpful for me um, to take a bunch of entrepreneurship classes when I was here at Stanford. I took the Lean Launchpad class for Steve Blank at the GSB. There's a couple of formation of new ventures classes. Um, there's ETL. Just to see more people who are just like you a few years out who did it. And there's no magic to being an entrepreneur. Most of it is grit and picking yourself up and failing and then listening. So listening to your customer and being obsessed with your customer. Like I wake up and I love ranchers. I just love people who steward the land. It's like it makes me really excited to go serve them. Um, I, I think there are other ways to start a company, but you have to find your guiding, um, that guiding heart of why you're doing what you're doing, which is gonna get you through the rest of it. But it's not, you do not lack the fortitude. It's mostly just, just doing it. Um, is, is there's no magic to it, just do it. I think people would be interested in hearing a little bit more about your company. So where is your company now and what are your future plans? Okay, so we launched, out, so I, uh, I started prototyping actually our first at Tomcat Ranch, uh, who was our first customer like three and a half years ago, um, and just listening through Steve Blank's class on what, what our customers wanted and uh, really resonated with this win-win-win proposition. Uh, of building healthy grasslands. And then since then, it really hasn't, the core of that hasn't changed. It's just, mm -hmm. that's our mission. Our mission is to make ranchers money while building healthy grasslands. And uh, what's changed is the how. And we've just, by, by talking to thousands and thousands of customers, um, developed our features to, it turns out that um, creating a ton of data and delivering them like a, a perfect solution for how they should uh, manage those migratory herds is. Uh, that's a little too much for someone who spent 30 years doing it and knows that he or she knows it better than you. So we just help them with individual decisions, keeping, keeping records, um, tracking where the, the herd has moved, looking back at the history, and then saving them tasks. Like saving them, putting the, a tree fell on a fence two hills over, I put this down and tasked it to one of my interns or one of my staff and that say, if I can save the manager three hours of their time, I can elevate their intellectual capital, their human capital, to be thinking more strategically about how they, they manage uh, the grassland. So that's, that's what we do now. Um, so there's been slight you know, feature pivots. Um, we now are in 6,000 ranches in 30 countries, uh, and we're just building towards you know, monetizing more of those and um, mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still a long way to go. <laughs> 
So uh, Solstice is still early stage. We haven't formally launched. Um, we started off with the support of the Innovation Transfer Grant from the Tomcat Center uh, about this time last year. And we were really looking to build uh, solar and storage systems that were easily integrated with the backup power sources that Nigerian homes and small businesses use. Uh, but in the process of talking and listening to customers, we realized that there was a lot of gaps and challenges even before trying to deliver them solar or storage alternatives uh, for their homes, coming in the form of metering and uh, revenue collection. And so we had already built a hardware system and software that allows our systems to run better and manage energy from multiple power sources. And so we decided to run with that um, because that's what the customers wanted. We ran a pilot project last uh, October in Lagos, Nigeria with homes and property managers. And again, the feedback from the user and understanding multiple people in the energy ecosystem told us that we needed to make some more modifications to the hardware. So uh, again, being ready to be told you need to do something differently, uh, something you have to get used to. Uh, so right now, we're finalizing those hardware modifications. We're doing testing. We finished software and mobile MVPs. And we'll be entering a beta phase in June. And we're really excited because we've already sat down with the uh, CEO of the two largest real estate development companies in Nigeria, um, three huge solar companies as well who are all really excited to help uh, Nigerians use energy more efficiently and integrate cleaner alternatives. At Kiwi, we are uh, about a little over a year and a half into the process. Um, we launched our product uh, about a year ago this time. Uh, since then, we have been in more than uh, 10 buildings now, and uh, we are continuing to grow that customer base and in the process. Uh, as it was mentioned, it's a continuous uh, growth for the product and the company. So we take input from our existing customers, uh, uh, from our prospective customers, we modify our, uh, our product. And the, our product con uh, contains both a hardware component as well as a software component. Uh, we don't uh, manufacture the hardware ourselves, so we uh, we essentially partner with different ven uh, hardware vendors. And so we are building new uh, hardware partnerships, uh, expanding our base for uh, allowing to serve our customers with different preferences for, for the hardware options. And then uh, we are adding additional capabilities into, into the software. And essentially, at this point, we are um, heads down into, into sales, 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 and enterprise sales. And uh, with, uh, with sort of uh, fortunate uh, coincidence, we, we landed on, on Levi Stadium and understood that our, our uh, technology is very, very helpful for sports facilities. So it's, a, it's been a great adventure to start looking into that space, getting to know that. Uh, we are now a team of four, uh, and we are continuing to grow the team. So. Wonderful. I, I want to make sure we have time for questions for the audience. So let me um, ask Kat to come back up here, um, and you can have my, <laughs> my seat. So uh, if anybody has a question, we, ask, we just ask that you use a microphone. Or I think we'll bring the microphone to you. So just raise your hand. We have a question over here. Thank you. So, um, a couple of you on the speaker and Kat were talking about shifting off big ag from yield maximization to optimization. Could you talk a little bit more about what that means, in particularly with regard to trying to meet global food needs for the growing population? I'll, I'll just take a bite at it, but um, so the food needs for a global population is very, very important, but sometimes also used as a red herring. There is quite a lot of food production in the world, and it's important to ask of what and where and how is it distributed, um, because it can work against us too. So our, I would argue our aid policies in Africa managed to keep an entire continent down for a while because we dumped a lot of bad ag crops there and fed into corrupt foreign aid in some cases. And 
the massive amount of yield maximization in the United States setting has actually led to increasingly more of the food supply not being edible by human beings. It's animal feed or biofuels feedstock. Um, so I think we're fighting a very uphill battle uh, against is what has become the financialization of food systems. Um, if you think about where the return goes in the food supply chain, very little of it goes to the land steward on the one end, and a lot of it goes to the financial markets in the form of com commodity futures trading revenues, which is why the big financial firms are so interested in it. So it is going to be a rather big shift, and I think we're using every tool in the toolkit. We have a big buyer uh, demand strategy where we've recruited uh, the school districts in California that serve a third of the billion meals served every year to warrant that they will buy from California producers, which creates enlightened self-interest and new constituencies. But also it, it um, preordains those foods to be much more likely to be non-processed, non-preserved, cooked from scratch. Um, one of the biggest food vendors in the school meal system in California has formerly been Taco Bell. So we have to get political about some of this and say, no, a billion meals should be producing the supply chain that we want and the student outcomes that we deserve, not vice versa. And just add a couple of numbers to that. So 40% of the food in our food system in, in modern countries is wasted. So we don't, you, get, you hear statistics being cited a lot of, oh, we need to double the food production. We don't need to double the food production globally to meet global demand. We need to use the food system more efficiently and waste less in the supply chain. Um, in, the, in the developing world, 90% of the food that is produced is actually produced on small family farms. And so it is a, I think, a misconception that small family farms cannot produce enough food to feed um, the, the people who live off of this land. And the Stanford Educational Farm is a great example of a four acre plot where Patrick Archie tries to demonstrate how a family on four acres can produce an abundance of food if you manage the soil right. Um, in the first world, uh, a lot of our acres, the most fertile land in the northern Great Plains in the Midwest is, like Kat said, not growing food. It's growing um, commodity grains that are used for livestock feed due to a policy of uh, many decades of uh, subsidizing that corn. And uh, a lot of that system is propped up by subsidies. It's propped up by agricultural businesses that are selling chemical inputs to make a lot of money off of this whole like beast of a system that's come up from that, or the original, originally it was for subsidizing through, through the Great Depression. But now there's, we have an oversupply of this corn that is actually not the corn that you and I would recognize. And many satellite food processing industries that produce overprocessed food that is making us unhealthy and I personally think a lot of that land, that acreage, can be turned back into productive, healthy soil. Um, and there are emerging more and more studies that are showing that instead of depending on chemicals to fertilize land and extract nutrients from it and then you know, um, exterminate everything else that's not the crop that you're trying to grow, you're just like adding a lot of petrochemicals into that soil and actually degrading it over time, leading it to erode. What Farmers, many farmers who wouldn't call themselves organic, like they're one of the biggest organizations um, is called No-Till on the Plains in Kansas, like the center of Kansas, that is growing healthy soil instead. And when you increase the organic matter in soil, you can get yields that are at or very close, like 90% of conventional. So don't let anyone tell you that um, like organic is a niche or like we should maybe stop using some of these buzzwords because they've become greenwashed. But soil health is something that I think um, can bring together multiple perspective, multiple groups, um, and it's kind of a neutral term that, that people can get their arms around. Okay, I'm, I'm investing in the soil. The soil is a bank for food, and if I invest in the soil health, more food will grow from it instead of stripping it of its nutrients. Okay, we have another question here. Thank you. Yes, hi. Thanks for coming to speak to us. Um, my question is also food related, kind of piggybacking off of what you've just said. And I'm curious to know, because I've heard that no-till agriculture has um, these co-benefits for soil health and carbon storage, but also subsequently can require more pesticides and more herbicides because the tilling process can um, actually reduce the pests and the, and the weeds that are present um, competing with the crops. So from in 
a trade-off perspective, um, do these conservation, soil conservation practices require more carbon input overall, and do they require more pesticide, herbicide, chemical inputs too, compared to conventional methods? Um, and the second is more policy related. Uh, so I know the farm bill subsidies are a huge distortion on um, incentivizing farmers and investors to um, grow more commodity crops like corn and soy. Um, and I'm curious to know how much, how far can we meaningfully go without changing the farm bill at this very core level of trying to reduce some of the subsidies that are distorting the markets? Um, and if you know, there's a limit there, you know, what do you see as the best political strategies for changing the farm bill itself? Take for, um, so we're working a lot on soil science, which has been a very contentious and co-opted field for some time. Who knew that the soil scientist conventions can be so co filled with controversy, they literally have fights. The National Fertilizer Recommends is what basically has culminated from a drive towards industrial agriculture that is the annual recommendation based on a black box of data that's industry owned about how much input of any sort, primarily nitrogen but all the rest, the average farmer producer needs to put into their soil. It holds to a view of soil as a vessel as opposed to a living system. And there isn't any scientist who would agree that soil is a vessel, not a living system. But a lot of the science has been co-opted, even soils testing is way behind. It only knows how to judge what's in the vessel or what's not. Um, and so you get, you'll see these, it's a form that probably someone from the USDA helps you fill out and understand about what you need to put back in the soil because you took it out. Um, we have commissioned 14 of the world's leading soil scientists to rework what is an appropriate methodology for soils testing, viewing soils as a living system, a base of natural capital and they're publishing that paper this spring. Um, we have also um, uh, looked at, so the Farm Bill is a hard thing to change. It's uh, politically controversial to try to change it. People take a whack at it, and it's enormously complex as a bill. It has a lot of very good things. It has a lot of conservation um, resources and so on, um, but it has gone a long ways away from what was created after the Dust Bowl the Dust Bowl was not a wind phenomenon. It was a mining of soils phenomenon. It created massive erosion and huge human diasporas. Also very political because they weren't just white, poor, rural farmers. Massive numbers of people, particularly former slaves, were set adrift when we unleashed the um, soils issues related to the Dust Bowl. At, as a result of that, FDR and others actually crafted the soils conservation principles, which, are, which actually I think hold pretty solid today. I'm not a scientist, but I think they're probably pretty decent. We just started dismantling and not observing them anymore, and we got the farm bill as a result, which um, is uh, a poor incentive because it incentivizes and immunizes farmers to just produce yield. If you produce yield, you will get paid sort of thing. It doesn't matter what it is you're yielding necessarily from a human standpoint. However, there's a glimmer of hope that we see because there is a protocol in the Farm Bill to introduce new insurance product. You can propose a new insurance product. Um, and it could be not based on yield, but on soil health. So we're actually working with, uh, I think it's called the Metropolitan Group or some ubiquitous name like that, but anyway, to see if we can't propose a new insurance product in the near term. Uh, and then recruit landowners to move towards that, to get paid for producing the system we actually want, not the one that's harming us. Just to add on to, to your question specifically about the practice of no-till and the emergence of pests, um, I, I would caution against thinking about soil as a factory, like that you put in inputs and you get out outputs. It's, it's not a, it doesn't lend itself well to that kind of reductionist like chemical formulas, which is what most of agribusiness tries to do, but what we have to recognize is that soil is a living ecosystem. And so what you're trying to create is more life. And often, like we've seen in California coastal grasslands, when you're trying to bring in more life, you want more microbial life, right? You want, which support nematodes, which support little bugs, which support big bugs, and earthworms are in there, and, you, and then there are birds. So you're, you're trying to stack a lot of species on top of each other. Um, so thinking about it from that lens, 
not disturbing the soil, it makes sense, right? Because you, you create that soil structure because there's a multiplicity of animals, li critters living in it, microscopic and, and above. And then the emergence of pests, I would ask, you know, question, what does that tell you, right? So often when you're doing soil remediation, you will see like indicator species like come up in the first year and people will be like, oh, there's thistles, like there's weeds, we have, <coughs> we have, to, we have to spray everything. And then you're back to square one, right? What you're not seeing is that actually you're creating a succession of life, and and this is kind of what the NR, what the USDA NRCS um, is has now come around to, right? It is it's the recreation of a ladder of life and an ecosystem, and so if you have a, an abundance of one thing, is the predator is is there a natural predator? What, what parts of the food chain are you missing in that ecosystem rather than spraying it all and starting over again? So we um, are a little bit over, but I'm hoping that we can take a few more minutes of everybody's time. Uh, we had also gotten some questions ahead of time from the audience, so I wanna ask one, and this is maybe more for Uguim and uh, Hedy because it's, uh, and, and maybe uh, Christine as well, but uh, what advice do you have for how to turn an idea into reality? So this is even before you think about, you know, go out there and start a company, but what, what advice do you have about that? Um, mm -hmm. I can take a crack mm -hmm. at that, but please join in. Um, so, uh, I'm a strong proponent of uh, sort of the, the de-school thinking here at Stanford and also the Lean Launch Lab sort of uh, thinking in that uh, if you have an idea, if you recognize uh, a, a need, uh, the best way to first go about turning it into an actual product or making a change in the world is to really go talk to people who you think you would be solving that need for. Uh, in, in isolation, uh, we, we are all very good at imagining things. And so uh, one of the biggest learnings for me has been to, to know that in order for us to be successful as a business, we need to make sure that we are listening to uh, our potential customers. So really talking to as many potential uh, buyers, as, as many potential customers as you can to really hear people understand what, whether the, the idea that you have in mind is really resonating with what they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that's the case, then uh, that's a great sign and you can, you know, that, that's the sign to go for it at that point. Great. Um, as an engineer, I tend to think very technically and um, it's easy to feel like I found a technical solution, so I must have solved the problem. Uh, but when you go and engage with your users or potential customers and buyers, you start to get a better understanding of non-technical issues, which tend to be a huge barrier, actually, when you try to start a company. And so, again, I would double down on the thought that you really need to sum, um, submerse yourself in the problem and really understand it and go to the market trying to learn from uh, your users or your customers instead of trying to go and push your product or your idea onto them. And um, it'll do you... a great deal of good and save you a lot of time. And so we've done that and I think it's been really valuable. Also, not only talking to your customers and your users, but understanding the entire ecosystem. I know for me in Nigeria, there are stakeholders who I never anticipated would care about what I was doing, um, but do and can have a huge impact on the success of my business. So um, that's important as well. One final question, which also came from uh, the audience, and this is uh, actually for Kat. So we have people, prospective founders of new ventures in the audience here. Uh, if they are thinking about how to best position themselves and develop um, themselves, what do you look for in the projects and uh, people that you invest in? Um, so I'll take it, Radical Impact Partners is the early stage venture fund that we developed alongside the bank partly because banks are not the appropriate financing vehicle for startups, but if we want to produce a new economy, it's going to be filled with a lot of startups, either experienced teams who are doing something they never did before or ideas that no one ever had before. So we started the venture fund and gave it the same three verticals, but we also insisted that it be transformative first, that it be um, hit financial benchmarks because it was finding transformative ideas and sustainability and innovation that works, um, which is also answers the scale question, because if it's really transformative and it's really gonna take over from the market, it's gonna scale fast too. Uh, so we are looking for that systems approach 
I'll give one, ex um, maybe two anonymized examples. Um, uh, a large legume tree uh, organization wanted to reintroduce these into degraded citrus lands. So they had a cheap real estate plan, going to do this sort of plantation version of a, a, new, a better tree, producing high high value proteins and seed cake for animals and so on. And we said, it's awesome that you found this great tree, but it's not, it's reinforcing old systems. We don't like plantation systems because they lend to, they lend themselves to uh, industrial scale uh, homogenous plantings. It's not integrating into the other systems that are important like water and carbon and solar and everything else in a way that's meaningful, and it's perpetuating the CAFO system. You're just giving them a feeder seed cake. To their credit, they went back mm. and at our urgings and started thinking about it as an integrated cropping and grazing scheme that gave resilience to the producers, an on-site feed that didn't need to go to the CAFOs, uh, and worked in combination with one another. Remains to be seen, they're still sort of in basic research. Or um, a food company, that's trying to reconstitute the indigenous rights of tribal reservations who always supported the buffalo. We exterminate the buffalo as a political action. So giving them back the market for smart protein bars based on the buffalo, which is the best ungulate for prairie perennial grassland communities, you know, that has real political repercussions. So we, we don't just look for a good idea, to be perfectly honest. It has to transform big systems. It has to be political. It has to recreate distributed power, not concentrated power. We want nothing to do with concentrated power schemes. Um, so it's a, it's a, it means that we say no to a lot of companies that really have a great idea, but they're going to find somebody else mm -hmm. to get that done. Thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking these four inspirational women. Thank you, guys. That was so fun. <laughs> For coming.